Коллеги, добрый день. Коллеги, добрый день. Let's begin the press conference by the governor of the Central Bank, Elvira Nabiulin, and the deputy governor, Alexei Zabotkin. To begin with, we will have the statement by the governor following the board of directors meeting. Good afternoon. Today we have made the decision to keep the key rate at 16% per annum. Last year, we could observe a surge in inflation. This implies that the economy was growing at a pace above its potential. In other words, overheated demand was significantly exceeding capacities to ramp up output. We responded to this by raising the key rate to 16% per annum. Today, we can clearly see how efficient the monetary policy transmission has been. Monetary conditions have become tight. Promoting savings and gradually cooling down the demand for loans. As a result, price growth has started to decelerate. Nevertheless, there is still uncertainty about the future pace of these disinflation processes. Therefore, to ensure a sustained return of inflation to the target, we will need to maintain tight monetary conditions for an extended period. Our policy will help decrease inflation to 4, 4.5 percent this year and stabilize it at the target further on. I would now dwell on the reasons behind our today's decision. Firstly, as regards inflation. Current price growth rates were at the peaks last autumn. Inflation trends have weakened primarily owing to the monetary policy tightening. It has had a disinflationary effect through the interest rate, exchange rate and expectations channels. The key rate increase has pushed up credit and deposit rates, which has decelerated the expansion in lending and boosted growth in deposits. As to the exchange rate channel, the high key rate has made ruble assets more attractive, moderating the demand for imports and, accordingly, foreign currency. This has helped stabilize the ruble exchange rate. The pass-through of the ruble weakening that occurred in summer to prices has completed. Finally, financial market participants, households and businesses have started to decrease their estimates of future inflation from extremely high levels. In December and January, we observed a slowdown in seasonal adjusted monthly price growth compared to the rates recorded in autumn. Moreover, this was largely due to components reflecting sustained price movements. Core inflation edged down. In January, price growth generally remained nearly the same as in December. The only exception was prices for housing and utility services that were rising faster in January. The growth in this segment was largely associated with more expensive health resort services and trips. Apparently, seasonal growth in prices for domestic tourism could strengthen because the Russians have refocused on domestic travel. Thus, the decline in sustained price movements is already obvious. These disinflation processes might be uneven, but according to our baseline scenario, they will bring inflation back to 4, 4.5% by the end of the year as a result of our tight monetary policy. Secondly, the economy. Last year, GDP reached 3.6% which is much higher than was forecast. The main driver was domestic demand. Investment increased most significantly, which is attributed to the structural transformation of the economy. Flash data show that investment activity continues to grow, although more slowly. A major contributor to the economic growth was consumer demand, supported by rising wages and lending. Consumption had been soaring until the end of last year. We have not yet received comprehensive data for the beginning of 2024, but our regional branches could see signs of a slower rise in consumer activity in January. Regional differences in consumption and business activity, lending and inflation are analyzed in detail in the Regional Economy Report. The strong growth of GDP might also mean a more substantial recovery in economic potential. 
The need to transition to domestic production has been promoting investment demand and the launch of new production capacities. Last year, the country was actively developing transport and, log and logistics infrastructure. There are examples of import substitution for domestic production in the consumer goods, food, furniture, and household chemicals manufacturing industries. Nevertheless, the expansion of the economic potential is always a slow-moving process. While aggregate demand in the economy supported by government expenditures and quickly growing lending has risen much more notably. Consequently, even despite the improved production capacities, the significant surplus of demand that is overheating in the economy had been translating into soaring prices. Apparently, the peak of that overheating was in autumn. As a result of our key rate decisions, the economy has started to gradually return to a more balanced growth path. We can make such a conclusion because inflationary pressure has been slightly weakening during the past two months and the labour market has not been tightening further. The demand for companies' products has been growing somewhat more slowly than before. Our monitoring shows that such estimates are common to most industries. Estimates of demand growth in industries manufacturing investment goods remain high. As regards businesses' expectations for demand, they stay close to record highs, except in mining and quarrying. Furthermore, labour shortages encourage companies to invest in labour automation and labour productivity growth. This year, the economy will be growing at a more moderate pace. However, compared to our October forecast, we have raised the estimate of GDP growth to 1-2% due to household consumption. Next year, the economy will return to steady growth rates, considering the increase in economic potential and the structural transformation of the economy. Its annual growth is expected to reach one5 to 2.5% percent, which corresponds to the inflation target. Thirdly, monetary conditions have been tightening further. The yield curve of federal government bonds has become more negatively sloped. That is, long-term interest rates are lower than short-term ones. Short-term yields remain high, which is associated with market participants' expectations about the duration of the period of high interest rates. Contrastingly, long-term yields have declined, which is the evidence that financial market participants' inflation expectations have lowered. Both credit and deposit rates have been growing further. The expansion of consumer lending has decelerated notably amid rising interest rates and tighter macroprudential requirements. The amounts of new mortgages seasonally adjusted have been declining recently. The decrease is faster in the market segment where the monetary policy transmission is not distorted. Subsidized mortgage lending saw lower issues compared with the autumn peaks, which is due to the changes in the parameters of the subsidized programs. Nonetheless, the issuance rate remains high at the level of early 2023. The expansion of the corporate loan portfolio has slowed down compared to mid-2023. Corporate lending will continue to grow, although more moderately than last year. At the end of 2023, the saving ratio increased. Saving activity has stayed high in early 2024 as well. Owing to a considerable rise in incomes, households are able to both consume and save more. Nevertheless, higher interest rates, especially amid lower inflation expectations, will be increasing the propensity to save. Now I would like to speak of external conditions. The situation in the world economy is generally better than expected. However, as the main driver of economic growth is the service sector, which is less resource intensive, this does not result in a considerable expansion of the demand for commodity exports. At the end of last year, exports contracted in terms of both prices and quantities. One of the factors was additional difficulties in foreign trade transactions related to settlements and logistics. In the second quarter, the oil market might shift to a surplus. Non-OPEC plus states are going to actively expand oil production, which might put additional pressure on prices.
Considering these trends, we have revised our forecast for foreign trade, decreasing the estimate of exports for this year, whereas the forecast for imports has changed only slightly. As a result, the trade surplus will be smaller than last year and below the level of expected in our October forecast. Pro-inflationary risks are still significant. In the first place, these risks are related to external conditions, including secondary sanctions and deterioration of the situation in commodity markets. Second, there are risks associated with inflation expectations. High and unanchored inflation expectations are more sensitive to short-term rises in prices for certain products and services. This might might entail secondary effects on inflation. Third, the response of lending to tight monetary conditions might be weaker if the government maintains extensive subsidized programs. Finally, in a persistently tight labor market, labor productivity might be growing more slowly than wages, which involves risks as well. I would also like to mention disinflationary risks. The increase in demand might be slowing down more quickly than expected in our baseline forecast. Besides, if the growth of the economy was driven to a great extent by the expansion of its potential rather than the cyclical component, inflationary pressure might be weaker. Winding up, I would like to comment on monetary policy prospects. We have raised the forecast of the annual average key rate by one percentage point. The average key rate will equal 13.5 to 15.5 per annum in 2024 and 8 to 10 percent per annum in 2025. This is because we need to maintain tight monetary conditions for longer to ensure a sustained return to inflation to 4%. We do see room for a key rate reduction, but our forecast assumes that the key rate will be returning to the neutral range smoothly. The future path of the key rate will depend on the extent to which the nature and pace of disinflation processes will be in line with the objective to bring inflation back to the target by the end of the year. The discussion that preceded the vote on our today's decision will be detailed in our new publication, Summary of the Key Rate Discussion. It will be released on February 27th. Thank you for your attention. Dear colleagues, now over to your questions. Uh, please do not forget to introduce yourselves and identify your agency. Rita, in the first row, please. Thank you very much, Edita Spilevskia, TARS Agency. Traditionally, I would like to ask you what were the options that you reviewed today and how broad was the consensus? You mentioned that if there is some room, uh, then you would approach it gradually. It doesn't mean that one shouldn't expect in the first half year no uh, softening. We looked into two options uh, regarding the key rate to keep it as uh, is and to raise it. And uh, we uh, would quote various arguments in the summer of discussions that we're going to release in a week's time. But towards the end, we arrived at the consensus around the decision to keep the rate as it was. As far as the room for further rate reduction is concerned, yes, indeed, it is there. But in our mind, it will take uh, place gradually. And uh, by the way, reducing the nominal key rate, uh, percentage rate, as long as inflation expectations subside, because you need to take a look at the real rate, which could also mean that uh, tight monetary policies shall sustain. We discussed uh, amongst the colleagues uh, the point in time when the first reduction of the key rate may happen, so the breadth of views was quite extensive, but the majority believed that it most probably happened in the second half of this year. Next, please, your questions. Nastya in the fourth row. Thank you. Anastasia Savilio from Interfax. 
And um, uh, in terms of the future monetary policy signal, can we believe it to be neutral um, since you've taken out of the phrasing the specific direction of that particular message and signal? Will that remain now for good? And do you continue to expect that the situation in inflation will turn around and the annual inflation will hit the peak during the spring summer this year? And what were the specific arguments that were put into the basis of your decision to raise the forecast for the average rate for 2024-25? Yes, one can consider our signal to be neutral, but uh, if you possibly have noted, because of the change in the format of our publication, we also altered our press release. And effectively, it seems to me that one may note that uh, the overall signal is neutral. First of all, we believe that the monthly inflation peak, the current inflation, the monthly seasonally adjusted, has already been passed. It was passed in the autumn of last year. But with regards to the annual inflation, which uh, reflects the price growth over the past 12 months, indeed, it may happen in springtime. And actually, the annual inflation indicator growth may not be standing too much apart from the current one, just several percentage points. But in the beginning of July, it is expected that the utility services tariffs may grow, which may temporarily impact the annual inflation. But overall, we do see that within this year, as the result of our monetary policy, the inflation in terms of its stable components will continue to decline so that the end of the year annual inflation um, to be 4 4.5%. Four and, and uh, Mr. Zabotkin, um, uh, I suggest that you are on side about the tightening of the forecast for the key rate. Well, basically speaking, the uh, um, higher uh, key rate forecast for this year and for the next year um, uh, reflects uh, on the fact that the board of directors following the discussion and uh, other entities involved in preparing the decisions do currently note the start of uh, the uh, rate going down a bit later compared to what they were able to uh, witness uh, by the October board meeting. So average throughout this year, we will uh, see a higher key rate, and maybe because we're going to enter the next year with a high level of the key rate, so the average throughout the next year is also going to be higher, and that uh, can be explained by the fact that one needs to additionally assess the stability and uh, the pace uh, of uh, the inflationary pressure going down. Now, in terms of the signal phrasing, indeed, we took out uh, this standard template uh, uh, description of what we're basing ourselves upon. We do come from the very same consideration like what we explained in the previous press release format. I uh, basically would say that we have decided that everybody has already embraced that quite clearly. And so if the signal is given direction, that would be also phrased in the same kind of wording that we previously have used. Thank you so much. The next question comes from online. Sergei Malukov, the Lipetsk Gazette. Good afternoon. Uh, the central bank doesn't rule out the decline of the key rate in 2025. Now, I would like to ask what we believe to be the most optimal way to uh, lower it, uh, considering the circumstances. Uh, uh, will it be just uh, like a mirror like attraction of what uh, and the, the pace at which you have been reducing, or you were reducing it last year? Thank you very much for your question. Within the current circumstances, since we're talking about a gradual cooling down of inflation after the over heated demand rather than a quick uh, reduction of it, like, for example, the case was after a dramatic price hike in 2014 and 2022, we believe that the most probable way to go about reducing the key rate will be in the form of gradual, consistent steps. Well, the uh, volume of such uh, steps will be dependent upon the information and data that we would receive about the speed of the inflation decline, about the inflationary risks. But if you recall a dramatic uh, key rate uh, rise that uh, occurred in the second half and in the August of 2023, it was conditioned by the need to 
extinguish the risks that might have led to a stronger inflationary pressure. And due to the fact the economics uh, operate, I mean, the consumer behavior, businesses behavior, inflation is much more eagerly gearing up rather than slowing down. And that is why the central bank, which is responsible for the price stability usually, is faster to uh, do the key rate uh, raise uh, in order to reduce the risk rather than to reduce it after things happen. Maria, in the third row. As you have several times mentioned, the Bank of Russia will increase its forecast for the key rate for 2024. How that may affect the Russian economy and should we expect a recession? We uh, specifically, uh, one should raise the key rates on a timely basis so as to avoid recessionary risks so that the disbalance between the demand growth and uh, the uh, production of services and goods which is lagging behind wouldn't push the inflation upwards that we would have afterwards to, to quench by extensive key rate increases, you see. So our basic scenario doesn't have that. Mr. Zapotkin, I would like to underscore that the GDP forecast, I mean, the GDP growth forecast this year has been risen up to 1 to 2%, uh, nevertheless, despite the fact that the actual last year was higher than the previous forecast. So the way one should think about it is that the economy is entering this year with a greater impetus towards growth, which respectively generates a longer and more stable period of inflationary pressure. And so as a response to this, the uh, key rate shall remain at the current level, possibly much longer. So the level of tightness of the monitoring conditions is going to be um, perked up, but the GDP forecast is also going to be higher. Uh, the previous question came from Maria Felucina. Dear colleagues, don't forget to introduce yourself. The next question comes online. Elisa Fieta Shevelina, Just Media Online publication from Ekaterin subsidized mortgage was the mortgage market driver in 2023 and it is believed that the key rate became the reason behind the uh, uh, price growth uh, for the oh no no sorry it had it, 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 it I mean the subsidized programs uh, became the reason behind it so what is the role you attribute to this particular factor when you decide on the key rate or maybe the central bank believes that the mortgage bubble will uh, gradually dissipate because of the macroprudential measures thank you subsidized lending program actually not only only in mortgage sector. These likes, they create the kind of segments in the lending market which are less sensitive to the key rate and sometimes even not sensitive at all. And so effectively what that means, it means that if using the key rate we impact the aggregate demand and upon the lending activity overall, then the central bank has to put in greater pressure to change the key rate in terms of the um, lending market uh, fundamentals. And we do take it into account when we decide about the key rate. You are certainly correct saying that there is a problem of financial stability and the central bank's task is to support financial stability. And what does it mean? It means restricting high risk and consequently potential uh, bad debts in individual uh, parts of the financial system, which we do by applying macro prudential measures specifically. <laughs> macro prudential measures are the ones which deter such risks accumulating. The side effect of it is that this prevents excessive price bubbles growing with respect to these uh, prices, and specifically the housing. We do not believe that we are facing uh, a mortgage bubble, but the mortgage risks have strengthened. We mentioned it because we noted the overheating uh, characteristics when the high demand for mortgage, which was supported primarily by a subsidized program, led not to the availability or affordability of housing, but g prices growing. Uh, looking at the last year, the uh, subsidized mortgage 
programs lending uh, accounted for 60 percent. So the government decisions to alter the characteristics of the subsidized programs will certainly cool down this market segment. But we do uh, note that the market mortgage is very adequately uh, responding to our key rate decisions. Dear colleagues, Delia in the last row. Thank you. Dilera Sonsova from RIA Novosti. Ilvira Sahib Zadovna, the central bank, a month ago stated that it is against extending compulsory sale of uh, currency revenues by exporters, but due to the fact that the ruble exchange rate has been weakening, are you not going to reconsider your position? As we have already mentioned, the Bank of Russia doesn't see any serious reasons to extend the compulsory uh, sale of uh, currency earnings. We believe that the importance of this particular measure, I mean, selling the currency uh, earnings, in order to stabilize exchange rate, is significantly weaker compared to other effects because the core effects came from the key rates being risen and from tighter monetary policy measures, which, I shall remind you, we undertook within a short period of time, I mean, the, uh, by raising the key rate uh, twice. And specifically, the key rate made higher boosted the attraction of uh, ruble savings rather than in currency savings as well as uh, held back uh, the spiral of growth for imports and also the exchange rates in fourth quarter when stabilization was setting in it was uh, affected by the trade uh, balance i mean the growing revenue uh, on the part of the russian exporters in august september prices grew for our export goods and commodities and considering the lag in terms of transportation and payments this currency revenue entered the market in the second half of autumn we are certainly analyzing the data, but uh, uh, in our mind, uh, these are the basic fundamental factors which impact uh, the exchange rate stabilization. Thank you. Uh, next question comes uh, online. Alexey Tretyakov, the Red North newspaper from Vologda. Alexey, please. Good afternoon. One of the factors which stimulates inflation is described by the regulators as a disbalance between domestic demand and supply. But uh, at the same time, considering high rates, the business activity is going down and uh, the manufacturing of goods also goes down, which uh, impacts negatively upon the market supply. Don't you see a contradiction between a tight monetary policy that is currently pursued by the Bank of Russia and the aim to reduce inflation? No, there is no discrepancy. There is no contradiction. Uh, but indeed, the rate affects both the demand and supply and investment, that is true. But demand is much more sensitive to the rate level rather than the supply of goods and services. That is why the effect from a tighter monetary policy is strictly disinflationary. And the countries which tried to uh, overturn this uh, truth uh, do enjoy both high inflation and uh, very low lending possibilities. And actually, high cost of lending is being affected not by the current uh, key rate level, but the expectations of future inflations, which are being reflected in the long-term lending rates. And by the way, if you note, our long-term lending rates started growing back from autumn 2022, meaning to say three quarters before we began raising the key rate, which means that the marketplace whose inflation expectations were growing reflected that in the long-term rates. And that was happening 
directly because of the inflation expectations strengthening. Currently, we see, uh, on the contrary, uh, the mid-term rates are lower than our key rates, which means that the market participants do expect that as a result of the tighter monetary policy, the inflation is going to subside, which makes these long-term uh, rates more attractive. And I would like to uh, put it to you that the share of rates are currently growing. I mean, the ones that the businesses are resorting to as a floating rate, amongst other things, to fund their investment projects. As far as investment projects are concerned, what is important is not the current uh, key rate level or the current rate level, but the kind of the key rate, uh, if the floating rates are linked to the key one, what kind of a key rate on average will be throughout the lifetime of a project. And uh, the stronger is is the confidence that the monetary policy and the level of the current rate is sufficient in order to bring inflation back to its place, then there is a greater level of confidence that the uh, lending rate is going to go down. And we currently ascertain that the floating rate uh, lending uh, does reflect the future reduction in the key rate, simply because the price stability uh, policy is going to meet its objectives. We want to draw attention to it. We continuously draw your attention to it. The key restriction right now is not the availability of lending and our serving does show it, but the limitations in the labor availability, because that goes both for the consumer um, uh, goods production, investment uh, products, and intermediate products. Just imagine if, uh, because of the cheaper equipment, there will be, uh, uh, because of the uh, cheaper lending rates, there will be a bigger demand for uh, equipment. If you can't produce more of it, simply because there is uh, labor shortages and capacity shortages, ultimately it will be simply more expensive, which will transform itself into prices growing rather than the uh, boost in productivity. And actually, whenever we talk about the manufacturing and goods and services, it is not slowing down because the pace of productivity growth and our forecast do point to that. But the main source of uh, funding investments has been and shall remain the uh, businesses own funds, their earnings and profits, because loans are being issued only when there is a return on your own capital. Because yes, we have uh, some businesses which were which are overloaded with credit, but uh, these are not uh, sort of loss makers. Uh, they are simply forced to resort to generating more debt to uh, sustain and so sources of funding investments out of profits is what is quite considerable in terms uh, as the factor that we see. <clears throat> Actually, we have some data until November, but if you put out of it the banking sector, then uh, the financial result, uh, the accounted uh, result in Russian companies exceeded 34 trillion rubles, which is approximately 3 trillion a month. This is a record result, which is 16 percent higher than, for example, in 2021. And so there are no indications that it is going to uh, fall. So um, in the meantime, the funding resource into new project is something that the economy does have, and we anticipate that the investment activity is going to be supported by these revenues also in case of a tight monetary policy. Um, Ivan, in the second row, please. Ivan Schligen, Fomag.ru. I've got the following question with respect to the transition of the key rates uh, into the economy. This transition has already taken place because we do see it in lending and in the deposits and the bonds are being issued because in the past there was a bit of a fear that once the key rate is raised to such a level, the economy is going to stall. I mean, not the economy, but the financial system, and it won't be able to survive with such a key rate. But nevertheless, we do see that everything works fine and the lending system works fine and the bonds are being uh, placed. So the economy is uh, going well. And so my question is about the attitude towards the rate. I mean, 16 percent is this high. Uh, should one consider it as high, or is it just some sort of an economy which is quite operational and uh, it uh, generates results, and so one shouldn't consider it as high? And another collateral question, uh, the loans that are being issued considering uh, the 16 percent key rate, uh, should one see here any risks uh, um, in terms of uh, there being 
that they will occur problems in servicing such debts, or you don't see that there are any principal risks one can live with such debts and continue servicing them. All right. You are quite right that the key rate does transform itself, translate itself into the economy. Not all of the facts have been exhausted. I hope that that shall continue with some lags. Now, what I mean to say, is it high key rate or the monetary policy is tight? It is indeed a tight policy because this rate um, is conducive to inflation going down through what? It slows down the lending pace to a balanced uh, level because last year the lending uh, pace was record high in, in many ways. So yes, indeed, this is a tight policy, but it doesn't hinder one from taking loans. Our um, economic lending forecast, and as far as businesses and households are concerned, we keep it in the positive area. The pace is going to be lower than compared to the record high, but the lending shall remain available and it will continue growing simply at the pace that wouldn't result in higher prices. Now, as uh, in terms of whether the businesses uh, uh, will face uh, if the uh, key rate is uh, raised, uh, would face the problems of being able to service the debt, we are monitoring it quite uh, uh, attentively uh, so as to spot any financial stability risks. There aren't any risks like that because you can uh, judge it uh, by the applications for the loan uh, restructuring because uh, during a certain period when the rates dramatically went down, the number of applications received to restructure um, uh, lending uh, was also quite active. And we do see that uh, household, not households, but the businesses uh, are willingly take the floating rates because they currently are able to see that they would be in a position and will have the capacity to services like that. Mr. Zapotkin, would you be able to add something? Well, maybe one more thought that the problem um, uh, to the financial stability of the borrowers usually uh, can be found amongst the loans which were taken at low rates when the soft monetary policy was being pursued. And then uh, all of a sudden the rates went up and uh, such businesses, because of certain uh, circumstances, uh, couldn't uh, pay back and they had to refinance those loans. And they had to refinance them at their rates, which were very difficult uh, for the business economics, which were put into the projects uh, back in the time when the businesses believed that these low rates are going to remain for forever. And so the banks are issuing uh, loans uh, at the kind of rates that they do were being quite scrutinous to the quality of the borrowers, and the borrowers themselves are trying to make sure that they have resilience. Uh, and so uh, the problem is in the different area. Uh, one other argument, actually, um, um, in our dialogue with the bank uh, that we see, uh, and the banks continue to quite eagerly issue corporate loans uh, because they do uh, see cash flows, uh, uh, there's quite uh, a strong profit, which creates uh, the safety cushion for borrowers. So uh, this economy continues to earn money, and that also supports uh, the lending rate. Uh, Elena, in the row before the last one, Elena Fabrichner Reuters, we're very happy to see you in a very good uh, spirit, despite the rumors that uh, you were not uh, feeling quite well, which is not surprising, considering your responsibilities. Uh, the governor of the Turkish Central Bank couldn't uh, withstand the growing pressure. That is uh, one thing. Um, and my second question, do you see any deficit uh, shortage in liquidity with RMB, with you are in amongst the banks and what do you intend to do? That my third question is that the Western countries continue to discuss confiscation of the uh, golden currency reserves or the interest uh, that it generates. What could be the response measures that Russia may come up with? Uh, Thank you. Uh, may I not comment on the first question? On the second one, there is no shortage of yuan. Uh, we uh, see, indeed, there are certain periods of volatility in the RMB market in terms of the uh, demand for the yuan denominated liquidity, particularly that was on the eve of the Chinese New Year. Uh, but you know, this kind of volatility uh, happened also with regard to US dollar and euros. We've got toolkits, we've got uh, currency swaps, and we have the same one for you on. It works, so we don't see any problems here. And the third question, right, uh, about the um, reserves. Uh, 
and the possible confiscation. We believe that this will be a very strong negative message sent to other central banks and effectively an infringement of the basic principles of protecting the central bank reserves. In the international legislation, this is one of the key basic principles. The asset immunity, um, uh, which belongs to the central banks, and that immunity provides for the stability of the international financial system. Stepping away from this principle will bring about uh, the undermining, even uh, gradual, but nevertheless, the undermining of the international financial system and uh, the value of the reserves globally. But on, the, uh, on our part, we're going to undertake all necessary measures to protect our lawful interests. The next question comes from uh, Victoria Shergina, uh, Law and Finance Project. Uh, good afternoon. Could you please tell us what is the way that the central bank uh, sees uh, uh, the inflation affecting the uh, fiscal spending? Because based on the electronic format of it, we see that in February the fiscal spending grew also in the beginning of the year. The Minister of Finance strongly funded government spending. Um, to what extent uh, the inflation spike in the middle of last year was related to it in May, uh, the same kind of a situation repeat itself this year. The fiscal spending and the fiscal uh, uh, deficit uh, are the factors that we do take into account when we make our decision because the, um, the fiscal spending, rather the fiscal uh, deficit, do impact aggregate demand. We act on the prerequisites where previously decisions have already been made and we are familiar with them, but uh, in as far as a certain spike uh, within a certain period of time, like a month, uh, may happen. Yes, it may happen. These things happen here, but in order to calibrate our policy, it is much more important overall throughout the full year to take into account the spending dynamics. Uh, however, we do take, to, take into account that such temporary fluctuations may happen, and the evenness of the fiscal spending is a very important factor. Now, the spike of inflation last year in many ways was conditioned by simultaneously com combination of the soft monetary policy and a soft fiscal uh, policy. Mr. Zapotkin, would you add something? Well, maybe I shall underscore that the inflation is being impacted not uh, by the uh, fiscal spending, but rather by the structural deficit in its broader sense. I mean, not on the federal level side of it, but in terms of the consolidated uh, budget plus the transactions that the budget uh, initiates uh, to invest the uh, National Welfare Fund uh, resources, uh, which may um, affect uh, the investment demand on the government sector. And so the distribution of income within uh, calendar year is of very secondary um, um, significance in, in terms uh, of its influence over the aggregate demand dynamics, because if uh, the whole situation in terms of deficit remains unchanged, and so and uh, the fiscal policy within the midterm um, expectation remains the same. Then the aggregate demand is going to also behave itself exactly uh, as it was during the for when the forecast was being made and the key rate decision was made. Marina, in the second row, please. Marina Pino, NTV Business News. You uh, left the rate unchanged first time since July. Can one unequivocally state that if the inflation situation didn't improve, that it has become stable? My second question is that the media now is talking about the central bank introducing various uh, uh, installment purchases regulation. Um, so it was about 60 to 80,000 rubles. If that is the step, does that amount of money uh, seem to you to be too low considering uh, the current prices for electronics and equipment. Well, as far as us uh, keeping the rate unchanged, uh, we do indeed uh, notice that the situation with inflation has improved because the inflation began weakening 
um, the one-off factors have exhausted themselves, the ones that led to inflation strengthening, including the exchange rate. But also, we see the same thing in its stable components, and we definitely accounted for that. Now, as far as the installment payment process is concerned, it is currently being debated. Let me repeat our position. We believe that one should introduce a certain regulation upon the installment payment, because essentially this is like lending, really, when interests uh, are being accrued uh, by the amount of the um, limitation here, we continue discussion because we want the installment payment for uh, households to be available because it can be convenient. You're quite right. Whenever people buy um, uh, durable goods, electronics, uh, but why we're trying to regulate it so, so that their household rights are uh, safeguarded because whenever we sign off on this uh, installment system, which do accrue high interest, and people not always are aware of it, and they have nothing to protect themselves from this, so that uh, violates their uh, lawful interest. So it is important for us to keep this ability for the household to pay in installments, but avoid them facing serious risks, like what may be the case when they uh, apply for their uh, high-rated uh, loans. We um, uh, regulate uh, norms in that, uh, and uh, various restrictions, but in installment payments, there is nothing like that. So we're going to consider that and debate it seriously so that it remains uh, available, but at the same time wouldn't create difficulties for the households. Colleagues, uh, in the fourth round, please. Sergey. Sergey Bolotov, arguments and facts. I've got a question about expectations and the employment. The central bank started raising, began raising the gear rate three quarters ago, but as you noted, the inflation expectations remain at a high level and remain unanchored. To simply put, uh, people live with a bit of a fear. Um, please explain the reasons. Um, the, is it psychology or is it uh, some uh, very volatile nature of the rural exchange rate? Uh, secondly, you also often note the risks that the growth in real wages is running ahead of the productivity. The, could you please tell us within which industries such risks are the strongest? And uh, is it possible for the central bank to achieve lower inflation um, with a, as a consequence with a, a record low Russian unemployment? You correctly stated that our inflation expectations remain um, at a high level, although we do see that they are weakening, but indeed they are higher than one should uh, 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 be content with and unanchored, and that is something that we watch out for scrutinously. This is a very significant factor whenever we make our decision. Uh, the current inflation expectations are higher than uh, what they should have been against this kind of inflation, without mentioning that they are much higher than what they should have been with the inflation at 4%. But at the same time, we do see that the inflation expectations go down. Based on the surveys, we definitely see that people aren't expecting any leap upwards. So the uh, expectations 12 months ahead do show that it is uh, uh, that the expectations are lower than the current uh, level of expectations. But here we do see a risk that the result of the high inflation expectations and may become even stronger under the impact of the one-off factors, uh, even, but uh, without mentioning the stable ones. So there is a risk that the inflation will pack itself strongly to a higher level, and that is another important consideration as to why one should maintain tight monetary policy in order for the inflation expectations to go back to more normal levels. And uh, consequently, uh, this uh, could uh, promote a stable inflation decline. And you're right, the exchange rate is one of the drivers which influences the inflation expectations. I mean, the exchange rate dynamics is a very strong um, um, uh, factor. But I shall tell you that our very tight monetary policy produces a strong, stable um, uh, 
uh, influence. So we can enjoy this indirect effect uh, and uh, this way reducing the risks in as far as inflation expectations are concerned. As far as wages and labor productivity are concerned, you are absolutely right. And by the way, we are also analyzing and discussing it with our colleagues in the government in order to understand what's uh, happening to labor productivity in different industries because we do acknowledge that the investments are currently taking place into growing labor productivity, into higher automation. Many businesses do that, and that is a very important thing to do. But what is also important is for that uh, labor productivity growth to have wages uh, follow it. Uh, and so the risk of there being a gap between the uh, productivity growth dynamics and wages um, can be uh, noted stronger in where there is a shortage of labor in such industries, uh, such as processing, such as uh, freight forwarding, construction, and um, uh, retail. Indeed, the unemployment is currently at a record low level. And so with respect to the inflation target, if we do achieve it, then it must uh, have such a market structure uh, uh, to it when the employers will have the capacity to um, uh, hire the kind of uh, labor resources that uh, would conform to the labor productivity. It's impossible to say when it will happen, but that is uh, one of the quality markers. But if the labor productivity growth falls behind um, the uh, um, um, purchasing power that would express itself not to, to, into an additional consumption, but to, into an additional inflation. Thank you. Next question comes online. Igor Lavrinkov, Avant Partner Publication Camera. Does Central Bank follow the uh, reaction on the part of the regional economics to the higher interest rates? And if positive, how this response changes uh, according to the higher key rates? Of course, we do monitor uh, situation in the regional economies um, overall, as well as in terms of the way it changes under the impact uh, of our decisions to change key rates. So one should mention that the general trend, the general response in between different regional ec economies to uh, changes in the key rate is uniform. You know, these are the same trends. Uh, the demand for consumer loans uh, slowed down. The household propensity to save growth um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, growth in consumer spending uh, also uh, edges up, but that uh, brings about uh, the inflationary processes. But the scale of such a response is different in between different regions because uh, every region is dependent upon a multitude of factors. Uh, in Cameroon, for example, the uh, global uh, coal market price trends uh, do play a role, as well as the uh, cargo transportation capacities. Uh, if we take a look at the Northwest, uh, and one of the key topics that we were looking into uh, throughout the past two years was the speed of the Western region's uh, production transformation, which previously had been um, exporting into the European markets, and so their ability to transform and adjust themselves to face the eastward export market. So this particular dynamics enable us to interpret the statistical data and make uh, more balanced decisions with respect to the monetary policy, which do take into account the economic uh, picture uh, much more broader. And that is why, for the past few years, all of our regional and, um, central bank representatives are involved in our key rate discussions, and we've always been demonstrating it to you in our uh, regional economic uh, reports um, that uh, we usually publish on the eve of uh, the uh, um, Silence Week. And that is something that all of our regional divisions uh, participate in preparing it. Margarita Mordovina, RBK. 
Businesses at different levels are complaining that uh, ever more often they encounter difficulties in foreign settlements with Turkey and China. Some businessmen propose to solve this problem by establishing a settlement a clearing center that the government is going to participate in, as well as the Bank of Russia. Now, what does the Central Bank of Russia think about this initiative, and uh, what are the ways that one may resort to and the central bank can resort to in order to solve such problems. Well, indeed, lately, in as far as the foreign trade settlements were concerned, the situation has been deteriorating. We are familiar with that, uh, looking at uh, the information received from our businesses. Um, what it leads to, I should say, it leads to a greater number of alternatives way of payments being analyzed. We are actively negotiating with the businesses. We are um, trying to wrap our minds around it. Uh, as much as possible. As far as the clearing of settlement centers with direct involvement of the central banks are concerned, I don't think that would considerably reduce the barriers that we're currently uh, uh, watching over. But nevertheless, we are discussing different approaches. Now, the future can be uh, seen in different ways, uh, uh, amongst other things, by using the digital um, financial assets uh, and the draft law, actually, to, to uh, make it possible uh, is ready and the possibility to settle uh, uh, in the uh, digital currencies of the central banks. Um, the main avenue is to uh, settle in the national currencies, but not only that, because the share of those has already grown. You've noticed it, but also using for um, transacting and settlements independent uh, structures, both for financial messaging as well as uh, to develop a correspondent system. But with respect to every country, there are certain specificities and peculiarities, and we are working with all of them. Michi, in the third row, please, now. Thank you. Dmitry, Morocco, Russia 24. Elvira Sahibzadovna, during the Katerinburg Forum, you expressed an idea to introduce a cooling period when issuing big loans starting from 1 million rubles. So, in theory, when this particular norm can become effective, and in terms of the period of time, this cooling period, how long may it last for, and will that uh, impact the uh, lending activity? Yes, we do believe then one should uh, uh, undertake certain expedient measure to combat uh, loan fraud and introduce cooling period for that purpose because we're currently discussing with the banks uh, this period um, which would last for two days. Um, in as far as big loans are concerned, because sometimes people want to get a credit uh, very quickly, but with respect to the big loans, I believe that one should introduce this particular cooling period, grace period. We are currently having a discussion with the bank, and hopefully this year we will be able to submit a, a draft law into the Russian parliament and enact it, uh, because there is no time to sit and wait. You need to really make a decision as fast as possible. Now, from the point of view of the lending activity, I don't think it will be impacted. There will simply be more scrutinous attention on the part of the bank towards anti-fraud procedures. In money transfer, there is already one like that, and it doesn't stall the activity in money transfer. So I don't believe that would impact negatively lending activity. Next question comes online from Denis Yelachowski. <clears throat> We can't hear you. No sound is coming, please. Unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, next question. Next question. Grigori, here from the room. Georgi Primitim, Forbes. Um, the um, question about the fees that the ma some of the major banks charge to the borrowers because of access to subsidized mortgage. Previously, central banks state that the, it is talking to some of the banks to uh, uh, do something about it. And so has it been possible to achieve some sort of a consensus? And if the banks won't adjust their current approaches, what are the tools or instruments that the central bank may have to 
convinced that they should uh, do so. Yes, there is a dialogue underway. The banks do voice their reasons as to why they do it and why it is not uh, as bad as the central bank considers this to be. Uh, we do take a look, uh, taking a look at their um, estimates and their arguments. One should say that some of the big banks, not a big number of them, uh, who introduced these fees uh, ultimately have given up on them. Uh, in our mind, the basic problems is an unfair competition. And so so the basic tool set is what the anti-monopoly agency has, and we also resorted to, to its capacities, but the competition may work differently, like, for example, DOM-RF. And we've uh, uh, gotten in touch with them, uh, telling them that uh, the limits to the subsidized mortgage should be made more available uh, in the case of the banks who, which don't apply such uh, measures. So what we can do in our part is the result of um, using uh, such fees, one of the negative consequences thereof is that the price of a housing will be higher than the market level. So these fees paid will be included into the overall value. And so as part of our market prudential authority, we insist that the housing which is uh, um, pledged uh, should be um, evaluated um, based on the market market uh, rather than anything artificially concocted. Yes, attempt number two, Denise Yalachowski, um, com complex interest publication. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, the key rate level is right now is much higher than the official one because we do observe inflation and so hardly likely that is something that the central bank uh, finds uh, satisfactory. Uh, what do you believe should be the correlation of, in your ideal model of all of the indicators in order for that uh, ideal model to be functional? My second question, does the board of directors consider the possibility to accumulate for an asset uh, in uh, um, you know, the nomination is different from you, Ayn. Does it not rule out to invest it into the non-reserve assets of the friendly countries? And largely speaking, to what extent you are worried by the diversification of assets, considering the fact that the yuan is not stable, and there may be a bit of a doubt in terms of uh, how the future growth of the uh, Chinese economy may fare? Well, the correlation between the key rate, inflation, and the inflation that our citizens are witnessing. There is no straightforward formula of the way this correlation should be organized. We believe it is normal when the key rate is at the level which enables one to bring inflation to the target if it uh, deviated from it. And if the inflation is at the target, then the key rate will uh, basically will stay at a neutral level, which we believe to be 6 to 7 percent. Now, as far as the discrepancy between the official and the observed inflation is concerned, practically it is always up there. But uh, the longer the low inflation is, then the observed inflation and the actual inflation uh, is uh, close to what we see in statistics. And actually, we've previously observed such periods where our observed inflation was nearing our own uh, within the period of low stable inflation. Mr. Zabotkin, will you add something? Well, maybe I shall remind us that in order for the key rate to generate impact upon the economy in a situation when you need to pursue a soft monetary policy where the inflation is below the target and we reduce the key rate within the period when the economy overheats, inflation is high, we need to bring the key rate further upwards. So in order for the key rate to impact economy, it need to respond to the inflation deviation, not one to one, because if it's one to one, then the real rate won't change. And the monetary conditions are not going to become tight if we raise rate and it won't soften up if we don't reduce it. So it needs to respond with a bit of a markup uh, ratio, which means that the gap between the key rate and inflation within the period of a tight monetary policy grows. And during the soft monetary policy, it goes down. So this uh, correlation is something that uh, one can observe in the case of all of the central banks which pursue this particular mechanism in their policy. As far as the reserves are concerned, uh, the reserves is something that the central banks need in order to 
uh, intervene if uh, there are risks to financial stability, because in such a case, uh, the bank uh, acts with financial interventions, currency interventions, but the currency of an intervention should be the one that uh, the market players have a demand for, and that is being defined by the currencies in which they do their foreign trade, the currencies that their debts denominated in, the currencies uh, that uh, they have as deposits. So currently we do see that there is a serious increase in the share of yuans, both in settlements, debts, and deposits, and that is why the structure of the gold and currency reserves corresponds to these particular objectives. We're currently not considering investing into non-reserve currencies because that would be reducing the reserves. Contracting reserves, in as far as other currencies are concerned, um, besides the fact that they should be in demand and sought after by businesses and uh, households, I mean, this kind of currency, you need to assess the market liquidity and the volatility in the countries where the high inflation is. The currency loses value, but usually that is not being considered as an attractive uh, means uh, to safeguard one's currency reserves. So we believe that the current structure does correspond to the objectives and goals that both the uh, businesses and economy are trying to achieve. Natalia, in the third row now. Good afternoon, Natalia Trushina, Moskovsky Kunzamolets. Well, my question is this. Uh, recently, in the social networks, in Telegram, and in the public mind, there is a conviction that the exchange rate before the presidential election will remain at approximately the same level that we can see now, about 992 rubles per dollar. Immediately after that, the government is not going to undertake any measures to keep it stable, and then it would uh, uh, dramatically lose its value. And we would again see the exchange rate at 100 rubles per dollar. Can the central bank comment on this particular expectation? Does the Central Bank of Russia itself planned post March 18th to introduce or to um, lift any currency restrictions? If so, could you describe that? And based on your expectations, what will be the ruble exchange rate uh, between the rubles, dollar, and yuan post March 18th? Does Central Bank have anything to say about the forthcoming spring? Uh, simply because the yuan deposit is also growing and the household have um, you know, saved uh, really this, some tangible amount. Well, thank you. Let me remind you that we've got a floating exchange rate, and we don't issue any forecast with regard to the currency exchange uh, rate. But I would like to draw attention as well that the ruble exchange rate and the current uh, ruble exchange rate is in its value is the result of uh, the fundamental factor. There are no artificial or unknown factors that play um, uh, onto it. The most important one is the consequence and the influence of our monetary policy and the trade balance. So these are two fundamental factors that impact the exchange rate, and these are the ones that you should follow. Quite possibly that uh, this um, thinking that the exchange rate is artificial may come from some perception, common perception, that the compulsory sale of the currency revenues is because of the exchange rate, and then if it's no longer compulsory, then the exchange rate is going to weaken. Our analysis indicates that the basic factors which impacted the rural exchange rate came from an improved trade balance and our tight monetary policy. These are the two ones that specifically brought about a stronger exchange rate. Even if you take a look at the compulsory save, compulsory save of currency earnings, the correlation between the uh, currency earnings uh, sale to the uh, earnings themselves was 94%, very high in December, in, in, in November, in December, 98%. 8%, very much higher than during the summer months, but the seasonal increase is when the exporters are selling their revenues towards the end of the year in order to pay dividends. So if you take away from it uh, this above normal uh, sales, uh, so the level of uh, currency sales was at the level of 2022-23. So um, in our mind, uh, the basic things are the fundamental factors that I have mentioned. So strengthening of the exchange rate coincided uh, with um, uh, the previous uh, um, higher key rate, and then there was uh, a uh, um, rebounding um, oil price uh, situation because it has a leg of two months 
and that is why it all happened towards the end of the year. So these are the two basic factors. There are no artificial measures at play. There are no expectations that these artificial things will disappear and then something will happen. No, there are no grounds for one to look at it this way. Wait a second. Yes, I think I've, I've answered. I've covered all of your questions. The next question online from Yevgenia Pismina Bloomberg. What is your assessment of the value of the frozen uh, assets of non-residents that are currently held on C-type accounts? How this uh, amount of assets grew and who is managing these assets? And if there is a swap, will these assets on C-accounts be enough, enough in order to swap the Russian investor-owned assets which have frozen abroad. If the EU decides to confiscate Russian assets in Europe, then will the currently frozen assets on sea accounts be reciprocally confiscated? Well, speaking about the bank accounts, C-type accounts, as of the point in time when they were introduced, the assets are gradually accumulating on them, primarily because of the coupon payments, the dividend payments, the um, principal amount so in the bond uh, payment scheme. There are no considerable changes that have occurred so far with regard to the C-type accounts. The basic reason behind any changes could be the revaluation of securities and uh, uh, payments. But we don't disclose the ultimate value or whatever remains on the C-accounts as far as any exchange or any swapping is concerned. You know, the different mechanisms have been proposed. They can be negotiated. But this is a voluntary bilateral exercise. Thank you. Fyodor, please. Fyodor Ivanov, Invest Future. Good afternoon. I've got two questions. The first one is about the compulsory currency earnings by exporters. If these measures remain, will there be any serious negative consequences which might follow? My third question is about third type. It is because the brokers started actively opening up accounts for their customers, but the law drafted cells haven't been yet uh, enforced. Um, most probably that will happen in spring. Should households and investors um, you know, delay and wait uh, for these amendments to be um, uh, brought into force? Thank you. As far as the compulsory sale of currency earnings is concerned, it has a very limited uh, influence over the exchange rate, which rather comes from the fundamental factors. But such a compulsory sale of the currency earnings, we believe, does generate additional costs for businesses as well as additional difficulties when they have to pay for import transactions when procuring equipment, because this money has to be reconverted back into the foreign currency and then effect payments from within the Russian infrastructure, um, further conditioned by stronger compliance and certain delay in payments without mentioning additional administrative burden um, uh, to uh, uh, um, adhere to the compulsory um, um, uh, currency earning sales. As far as the um, investment um, account three are concerned, you're right. The households can already start opening them. And there are certain tax deductions that are being planned. I mean, this law is being debated. It hasn't yet been um, passed. We hope that it will pass. And we are working with our counterparts in the government, hoping uh, to make it happen shortly. And so this tax deduction will be attributed to the investment accounts uh, three opened as of January 24, uh, from January 24. But, um, you know, it's now with the legislature. Um, so uh, we recommended the brokerages who open up this investment accounts three to uh, warn the uh, uh, households that this particular tax deduction is possible, but it not is not yet uh, made into law. Uh, Tatiana, in the second row, please. Uh, 
Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, Tatiana Dumina from Commerzant. I've got two questions. In the follow-up um, um, about the currency earnings, is it possible to say that towards the end of the year, uh, the um, um, uh, requirements uh, put in place uh, brought about uh, a stronger ruble and imports started growing as opposed to the scenario when there wouldn't have been any compulsory sale. Uh, the second question about the People's, uh, the People's Bank of China, because its active policy is slowing down the economic development, and what kind of uh, channels to try and influence it do you see, if necessary? Well, as far as uh, the compulsory sale of currency earnings and its ability to strengthen the exchange rate, we, we, we see it as an insignificant uh, influence because uh, it really produced very weak influence because uh, the basic influence came from the trade balance and our monetary policy, which both led to a strong exchange rate because the imports uh, have become less beneficial, while exports, because of a better market, Market environment saw additional income flowing into it. Now, as far as um, China is concerned and uh, the uh, importance of yuan in uh, uh, settlements, as I said, uh, both in the financial transactions, in business uh, uh, dealing settlements, and in deposits, uh, the uh, level of yuan uh, has grown, which makes this currency a more important one for the Russian economy. Not only the share of financial transactions and settlements grew, but also the share of uh, China as a counterpart in our uh, foreign trade, both in exports and imports. And such close relationships do mean that the trends in the Chinese economy, the dynamics that its national currency follows as opposed to other foreign currencies, um, uh, produces a more significant impact upon the Russian economy as opposed to what it used to be before 2022. But that influence uh, make it, is made possible through trading channel rather than the financial flows, uh, because the, this country's financial market uh, has certain uh, limitations as well, uh, you know, the cases where the Chinese domestic financial market, which is directly regulated by the uh, People Bank of China, uh, restricts certain capital flows. Mm, uh, for example, mm, uh, speaking about the influence that we recall being through uh, dollar and euro uh, because of uh, the uh, Fed policy and the European Central Bank policy is incomparable, but the extent to which the um, Chinese People's Bank policy impacts the overall economic activity, which may be related to our export commodity and the purchasing capacity exchange rate, there is such an influence in place, and we do uh, pay attention to it whenever we make our decisions. Anna, in the row before the last one. Good afternoon, Anna Gromova. Anna finance block. The Russian parliament prepares now for the second reading the draft law, which anticipates limiting the application of the floating rates in consumer lending. It also anticipates that the bank, in case of any changes, must warn a borrower about such changes in the rate beforehand. But at the same time, the banks are against introducing limitations upon the floating bank because they believe that it may lead to the losses for them. Now, to what extent the Central Bank of Russia believes that uh, the floating rate can be applied to certain consumer lending? And uh, yes, and, and what does the Central Bank think when commercial banks? Uh, stand against introducing restrictions or limitations upon introducing floating rates in consumer lending. Thank you. Well, in this particular situation, it is our initiative to restrict application of floating rates in uh, consumer lending is related to protecting the rights of the bank's customers. Because indeed, uh, the banks not always uh, support the kind of initiatives that we undertake to protect their customers. One should say that uh, um, so far the floating rates uh, are not being applied, are not common uh, as far as the households are concerned. Businesses and corporates, yes, because they have the ways to estimate the risk if the rates are changed, because households themselves can hardly make an assessment like that. They can borrow at the current low rates, uh, thinking that it will remain that for a long period of time and affix a signature to a 
a lending contract without understanding that they will have to more, more and more if something happens. So analyzing international experience, if they're raw floating rates in such cases, then there are certain ranges, strict ranges are being introduced within which such floating rates uh, can be increased. So we suggest that it should be limited, that the rates may grow mm, uh, not more than one third or not more than four percentage points, which would enable the households in terms of their financial status to service it. And actually, um, uh, we remember the discussion uh, about the floating rates, which was launched on the eve of this whole discussion so that to uh, later on transfer the uh, interest risk upon um, uh, the borrowers, household borrowers. So we need to act in a preemptive uh, way and people need to be warned in advance, you know, five days in advance, as the banks are proposing. That's not enough. They should be warned uh, long before that. Maybe one should take a look at the possibility of introducing floating rates um, 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 uh, for affluent customers, uh, 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 for uh, high net worth individuals who can afford it. But for the majority of uh, households, restrictions should be put in place. Dear colleagues, we are already um, overperforming in terms of our time. Our last question, Mitty, in the last row. Good afternoon. Dmitry Maslak, um, Chinese media corporation, global TV network. A lot has been mentioned about the assets and basically all of the questions that we wanted originally to raise have been already asked. But nevertheless, could you tell us, has there been any powerful uh, reaction from the regulators in different other countries, um, for example, in terms of the European regulators uh, with regard to the Russian assets. And um, this whole uh, issue, it's not a new one, practically. Uh, we remember the discussion uh, there all for the past six months. Doubt the central bank um, sees that the regulators in some other countries already undertake certain measures because the trust uh, towards the Western financial system has been clearly under mind. Well, in, in terms of um, any powerful signals from the countries which are trying to freeze our assets uh, is something that we haven't received, but we do receive uh, signals from the regulators and the countries and the jurisdictions with which we continue to keep uh, the relationship with, and we do see that there is a growing interest towards diversifying assets, creating alternative for settlement um, payment systems. I believe this is a very natural reaction to such kinds of risk, I mean, like uh, the confiscation of reserves. I am sure that uh, that will happen to many countries. I mean, they will try to diversify. That won't happen overnight because the role of US dollars in the global economy still remains high. But gradually, that will be happening. Thanks very much, dear colleagues. Thank you very much, all.